In this video, we introduce Koine Greek personal pronouns, the uh, grammatical basics of pronouns uh, with respect to sort of both English and Greek here. A pronoun is going to be a word that stands in place of another noun. Usually that other noun has already been named uh, in a passage or in a sentence, and then the pronoun stands in place of it so that the noun does not need to be repeated. One of the purposes of pronouns is that they avoid monotony. Uh, so you're gonna see this word often, uh, not only with respect to pronouns, but respect to uh, some other things as well later in Greek, the antecedent. So antecedent refers to the original noun that a pronoun stands in place of. So when a pronoun is standing in place of a noun, the noun that it refers back to is its antecedent. This is gonna be an important word for us. Uh, it's gonna come up often from here on out in our Greek journey. And so we have different types of uh, pronouns in uh, Greek and in English. So the important ones for Greek that we're going to uh, learn moving forward. This week we have personal pronouns. Later on we'll get to these ones. A personal pronoun being a he, a she, or an it. A demonstrative pronoun means this or that. This is the nearer the demonstrative, this. The, that is what's called the further demonstrative. That, it's further away. It's pointing to something away, whereas this is pointing to something near. A relative pronoun, uh, who, which, what. And then there's also reflexive, reciprocal, interrogative, and indefinite pronouns in Greek. Again, we will not be dealing with any of these uh, this week. We'll get to those later. Our energy here is on the most important or the most common uh, pronouns, which are the personal pronouns in Greek. So uh, a very important rule to know is that a Greek pronoun is going to match its antecedent in gender and in number. So remember, Greek is a highly inflective language. I don't know if you've heard of that before or not. Uh, so that words change forms based on their function in a sentence. Uh, this is gonna be true with pronouns as well. The pronoun is going to refer to its antecedent, but it can change its case. So uh, the case of a pronoun is going to depend be dependent on how that pronoun is functioning in the sentence. Whether if it's the subject, the pronoun is going to be in the nominative case, even if the noun that it refers to in a previous sentence was in the accusative case. That's because the pronoun is doing something different grammatically than its antecedent was. So uh, that being the case, pronouns are going to change their case, but they will always match the noun that they refer to in uh, gender and in number. So that's gonna be your clue to what word in the previous context or the previous sentence that a pronoun is referring to. Um, and so another sort of basic of pronouns in Greek is that pronouns in the genitive case uh, is the way that Greek likes to show possession. Um, rather than having a separate possessive adjective like my or your. Greek does have these, uh, and we'll see them later on, uh, but they are not nearly as common as indicating possession this way, by taking a personal pronoun and putting it in the genitive case to mean, you know, of me or my, of you or yours, and so on and so forth. So what I want us to do here is sort of given these grammatical basics that we've just laid out about both Greek and English uh, pronouns, what I want you to do is identify the personal pronoun in uh, this, one of my favorite English sentences. Aaron Rodgers threw the ball to Devontae Adams, it flew through the air. So actually two sentences here. Uh, which word here, there's only, only one of them is a personal pronoun, uh, which one is the personal pronoun in these two sentences? No, it's not Aaron Rodgers. No, it's not the ball. No, it's not Devontae Adams. No, it's not air. Uh, it is it. It is referring back to the ball. Um, and so it is the personal pronoun. And what I want you to do is uh, see if you can identify what case the ball would be in Greek. Let's do this one first. Let's take just a, a five second pause here. Think about what case it would be. Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, or vocative. It's the object of the uh, verb through, so it's going to be in the accusative case if this were a sentence in Greek. Aaron Rodgers would be in the nominative as the subject, and to Devontae Adams, the indirect object would be in the, that's right, the dative case. Uh, and let's do the same thing for it. 
what case would it be in this sentence, it flew through the air? Nominative, genitive, dative, or accusative? That's right, it would be in the nominative case. It is doing the action of flying in past time. It flew, so it would be the nominative subject. And so notice here that while in, in this case over here, in our first sentence, the ball, when it's first named and first introduced, it is in the accusative case, but over here, it is in the nominative case. So it can change its case based on its function in a sentence, but it is going to match the gender and the number of the ball. Uh, so in the case of the ball, we have a neuter word. It doesn't have gender. It's not a he or a she. It's a, it's a thing, an it, and it's a singular. It's one ball. Um, so it is it through flew through there. If we were to modulate this to Aaron Roger through the balls to Devante Adam, it would be they flew through the air. They would be changed to a plural to make sure it matches this. Or if we were to change this to, uh, you know, a person, uh, Aaron Rogers through Aaron Jones to Devante Adams, he flew through the air. The, the gender would change from a neuter to a masculine to reflect the, ant the gender of the antecedent. And so what I want you to do with these Greek sentences here, I'm going to uh, let you know that, uh, well, actually, I'm just going to tell you here. We're not going to do, do a pause here. Uh, we have uh, our, our personal pronouns are autan and auta. So here we have ha lithos. Uh, these words should be familiar to you. The stone, esti, is good. Blepes, do you see uh, it? So notice here, that autan is our personal pronoun, and it's referring back to lithos. Lithos is the antecedent of autan. And here we see that autan is in the nominative case. So you can, uh, this, or sorry, not the nominative case, the accusative case. And you can, we haven't looked at the forms of these pronouns yet, but that ton ending looks a whole lot like the definite article and the accusative, and that's exactly what it is. So this, this looks like the, uh, the masculine accusative definite article, and this is a masculine accusative noun. So notice here, and it's singular, uh, a singular pronoun. And so we have, let's just write this out to be clear masculine, singular, accusative. And over here, notice what our, uh, our gender, number, and case are. We have a masculine, singular, and a nominative. So while these two match each other, and Alton is referring back to the stone, uh, notice that in this case, autan is the object. Do you see it? Whereas the stone in the previous sentence is the subject. So autan is going to match the stone in, uh, in gender and number, masculine and singular, masculine and singular, but it's going to be different in case based on its function in the respective sentence. And then when we come down to our next example here, we have ta technon and auta matching each other. So auta is a neuter singular accusative personal pronoun. And this is because ta tekna is a neuter singular word. And in this case, uh, in the case of this sentence, it is in the nominative. The child is good or beautiful. Do you see it? So uh, we have a different uh, we have a different uh, gender of the pronoun here to because the gender of the word in the original sentence the antecedent of the pronoun is is different. So this all to illustrate the rule that a pronoun is going to match its antecedent in gender and number, but it can change. Uh, its case based on its function in a sentence. So if uh, this is not to say that it has to change its case, uh, it might also match in case if both are the subject. So if, if this uh, sentence were were changed so that alta was the subject of the verb, it could also be in the nominative. And in that case, it would match 
in uh, gender, number, and case, but it does not have to match in case. And so here are the forms that you will be asked to memorize of the personal pronoun for this week. We have the first person personal pronouns over here on the left hand side, and we have the second person personal pronouns over here on the right hand side. And so I've, uh, when I put these together, I put these together to make just a couple comments for sort of your help on memorizing them. You'll notice that they look very, very similar to one another. Besides the case of the first person singular, uh, the endings are all going to match between uh, between the two and what's going to be different is uh, these sort of initial letters or the uh, we might say the roots of them here. So I give you a couple uh, clues over here to uh, to differentiate between the two so that if you uh, oftentimes we get sort of confused uh, particularly uh, in the plural of the first person and the second person. Um, but so these clues are sort of to help you memorize uh, to help you differentiate and maybe also to help you memorize these forms. So notice here I say S for second person. So we have SU as the second person and EGO as the first person. And the SIGMA is reflected throughout the first, uh, the singular of the second person. So I associate this SIGMA with the second person to differentiate it with the MU of the first person, uh, M for me or MU for me of the first person. So M, me, uh, mu first person. And then uh, particularly tricky in my in my estimation is this down here, uh, that we have the exact same forms except for one letter, an, uh, an eta in the first person and a hoopsalon in the second person. And the way that I remember that the hoopsalon goes with second person is you sounds like you, which is the second person. Uh, so hoopsalon equals you, uh, the letter U, which equals U uh, second person. So just uh, some sort of uh, ways that may or may not be helpful for you to differentiate between these and these and perhaps help you with your memorization as well. Because if you can memorize the endings and then just uh, you only really have to memorize one set of endings and then be able to stick the different letters on the front of those endings there. And so lastly, here we have the third person personal pronouns, and you are not asked to memorize these for, for this week. And the reason that you're not asked to memorize for this week is because most of these endings should look very familiar to you uh, from a number of different places, actually. Um, so if you remember back to our adjective forms and our friends uh, Swain Ionisus and Asina Ionitsas uh, down here, and here respectively. These endings uh, look quite like what we find in our third person personal pronouns. So that you see uh, Swain reflected down here without the vocative, so we don't have vocative forms for the personal pronouns, um, and then Ionisus. And then similarly, we have uh, Sin, Ionisos, uh, the only difference here, uh, not having the ah at the beginning and also not having the awe of the vocative. So I've put these what's missing uh, from down here in our friends names in parentheses up, up here. Um, again, you're not memorizing this. Um, this is simply to point out that we already have similarities between the adjectives um, that you have learned already or seen already with uh, the the personal pronouns. And the same is actually true of, uh, so that I have taken off here uh, the adjectives just to show you sort of a bit more close up uh, the relationship between Swain, Ionisus, minus R, Epsilon, and Asina, Ionisos, minus R, uh, Alpha, Alpha in the um, nominative and what would have also been in the vocative. Um, but there's another way, another thing that the uh, the third person personal pronouns also look a whole lot like, and that is the definite article paradigm that you have already memorized. So the uh, the only place that this is really going to be uh, much different is in the nominative masculine singular, where altos. Uh, doesn't quite look like ha of the nominative masculine singular of the definite article, but otherwise, for essentially everything else, uh, you just add an alpha hoopsalon to the front of 
of the definite article paradigm, and you have the third person uh, personal pronoun paradigm. Um, and that's true for the masculine, for the feminine, and for uh, for the neuter over here. Um, and also always remember this handy rule that the neuter, nominative, and accusative always look identical to one another, and they differ from the masculine. That's going to be the case in our personal pronouns here, auta versus autos and auton, and then auta with an alpha versus autoi and autus in the masculine there. So let's talk a little bit here about the uses or the grammar of personal pronouns, the way that you'll see them functioning in a Greek sentence. The one, uh, the most common is to avoid monotony. Uh, as we mentioned back uh, earlier on in this video, that one of the primary functions of personal pronouns is to stand in a place of, of another noun, um, avoiding monotony. And this is what we call the substantive use of the personal pronoun, and this is going to be the most common way you see the pronouns used. And once again, the pronoun is going to match its antecedent and person and number, but not necessarily in case. Sometimes it will match in case, sometimes it will not match in case. And so what I want you to do here is sort of given the ways that we've talked about this and given you some of the examples that I've given you, uh, I want you to identify the pronoun in each of the following two examples and identify what case they are in and what their antecedent is here. And I've given you the English translation as a sort of way of helping you out here. So we have blepo ton anthropon kai gnosko auton, blepo ton anthropon kai lego auto. So uh, here I identify uh, what the pronoun is in each one of these sentences, what case the pronoun is, remembering, uh, remembering sort of adding, uh, when you add something to the definite article paradigm, um, it's going to make, uh, it's going to give you sort of the information um, or it's going to look like the, the definite article paradigm of the, uh, sorry, I'm not being clear here, the, uh, the third person, personal pronoun, uh, the endings of it uh, are going to look like definite articles in different cases and numbers, and that's going to help you out here. Um, and then what the antecedent is in each of these cases. So uh, take a, a minute or two here, pause the lecture, and, and go ahead and answer these questions. So what we have here is our two personal pronouns are going to be auton and auto. Look, this ton ending uh, looks a whole lot like a masculine accusative singular. Uh, and in fact, it is. It's the third person personal pronoun, masculine accusative singular. Um, its antecedent is going to be ton anthropon, which is also accusative masculine singular. So this is uh, an instance in which the case of the personal pronoun matches the case of its antecedent, uh, and it also matches the gender and number of its antecedent. So I see the man and I know him. Um, so because the personal pronoun and the man are the object of each verb respectively, uh, we have them in the same case. And then down here we have auto. Notice this uh, tau omega with a Yoda subscript. Uh, looks like one of, uh, actually looks like several of our um, our definite article endings, um, or what the definite article looks like, I should say. So in this case, we have a dative masculine singular, so matching the masculine singular of anthropon over here, but a different case because I am speaking to him. Uh, rather than, so he is, uh, the auto is the indirect object in the data, and this is why the case here is different than the case previously, but they match in person and gender. Uh, so another use of personal pronouns, uh, the what's called the emphatic use. Uh, so remember, because Greek is a highly inflected language, it can indicate the person and number of a verb uh, in one word, in the verb itself. It doesn't necessarily need a separate word as the subject to indicate uh, who is doing the action. But it can use a separate noun and it can use a separate pronoun. So when, a, when an additional pronoun is used, that's sort of extra information that we don't necessarily need. And when that extra information is given, it's sort of uh, giving an oomph to, uh, to the subject of the verb. So uh, we very easily could have uh, blepo ton kurion. This would mean I see the Lord. 
without ego. But because the ego here, uh, the emphasis is sort of being put on the fact that I see. I see the Lord, uh, but you see. Um, so in this case, we could have Allah pistues auto, but you believe in him uh, without the su that we have. But the su makes it more emphatic. But you believe in him. And then, uh, as we noted earlier, the most common way that Greek is going to show possession is by putting a noun or a pronoun into the genitive. So a genitive uh, personal pronoun is usually going to indicate possession of something in Greek, uh, equivalent to in English, my, your, his, her, its, our, y'all's, or theirs. Uh, so we would call these possessive pronouns and uh Whereas Greek is going to take its personal pronoun, throw it into the genitive case to indicate possession. And then uh, two more uses that are peculiar to uh, not all personal pronouns, but to autos uh, and its accompanying forms as well. Um, so this is the third person personal pronoun. And there's two special uses of the third person personal pronoun. Uh, the first is what's called the adjectival use. It can be in any case. Um, so nominative, masculine, uh, sorry, nominative, genitive, dative, or accusative. And it's going to be translated with the English word same. And it's going to be in what is called attributive position. So remember when we talked about adjectives, we talked about substantive, we talked about attributive, and we talked about predicate position or predicate uh, or functions of all of these three. Remember the attributive position is when the article precedes the adjective. And the same is true with autos or uh, a, uh, or its accompanying form. So it could be ta au ta, for instance, in the neuter. Uh, so when the article comes before the form of autos, then we're going to translate it as same. So ha au tas artos is the same bread. And the other special use of autos uh, and its accompanying form is going to be uh, translated self or selves. This can occur in any case, so nominative, genitive, dative, or accusative. And it is when the uh, form of autos occurs in predicate position. That is, the article is not directly preceding autos. Um, and so uh, this is a case where a uh, autos or its form is going to modify, um, it's going to modify another noun, as in the case of ha artos utos, and it's going to be the bread itself. So notice that the article comes directly with the noun, and then autos is uh, modifying in predicate position without the article directly before it. Artos, which is why we get self. So we can uh, have the intensive use with a noun like artos, but we can also have it with another personal pronoun or a verb. So in this case, we have it with another personal pronoun, su autos, you yourself. And this is a little bit uh, confusing because this is second person, this is third person. In English, we, we wouldn't combine these different persons, but this special intensive use of autos in Greek is going to be translated yourself in English. So you, yourself, no. Uh, or in the case of just with another verb, modif autos modifying a verb, I, myself, no. So we have uh, I know in here, and then the autos gives it that special self uh, bit. So even though this is first person and this is third person, we're going to try to translate this as a uh, as as a first person, myself, I myself know. And notice in all of these cases, the definite article does not precede autos; that it is in predicate position in each of these three different cases. And so now what we're going to do is practice uh, identifying these different personal pronouns and their uses in, uh, in a few examples right here. So uh, what I want you to do is go ahead and pause the lecture. I've given you both the Greek and the English translation. I'd like you to go ahead and read the Greek aloud to yourself. Uh, take a look at the translation and then identify the three different personal pronouns in the Greek sentence. So go ahead and pause and see if you can find the three personal pronouns. And uh, 
a little more help here. So here they are in English, your, him, and their. So see if this uh, changes your answer at all or helps you if you did not get to an answer. And a little bit more help. So I've given us here the uh, paradigms of the third person pronouns and the first and second person pronouns. So if you have not identified the pronouns in this sentence yet, you can go ahead and uh, pause, look down at the respective paradigms, and then look back up here uh, to, to determine what the pronouns are. So here is our uh, our answers here. Our first one is Sue, the second person singular genitive personal pronoun. We have then Auton as our next one. Uh, the third person uh, accusative masculine singular personal pronoun. And then Auton, the third person genitive masculine plural personal pronoun. And the next thing I want you to do now knowing uh, that those are the three pronouns. Let's underline them again here. I want you to go ahead and see if you can, recalling what I have said in this lecture about the different uses of the pronouns, see if you can give a name to how these are functioning. Um, and then you, this might be a hint for you as well, right down here. And so now uh, I give you the different uses. So once again, uh, see if this helps you if you were not able to identify the different uses. See if you can match up uh, some of the uses down here to what's going on right up here. So what we're gonna have is two instances of possession with Sue, your disciples. So the disciples belong to you or they're associated with you. And then there, the genitive uh, of the genitive plural in the third person personal pronoun. So there, the house belongs to them, into their house. So we have two instances of uh, possession with the genitive. And then we have one instance of a substantive, that auton is being is used as a substantive and its antecedent um, is the apostle that matches uh, in, uh, in gender and in number, and in this case also in case, because uh, both the apostle and auton are the object of their respective verbs. Agusen, in the case of auton, uh, they lead him, and uh, genos, uh, genoskusen, in the case of ton apostolon, uh, they know the apostle. So we're gonna do something similar one more time with another sentence here. So what I want you to do is once again, go ahead and pause the lecture and read our sentence here in Greek. Uh, take a look at the, uh, the translation I've given you and see if you can identify the four, in this case, personal pronouns in the Greek sentence. So a little bit more help. I give you uh, highlighted in English what the four different pronouns are. So see if you can uh, either correct yourself or uh, confirm your answer or add in an answer if you struggled the first time around, seeing if you can sort of associate the English personal pronouns with what's going on up here somewhere. And then a little bit more help. Once again, I give you these uh, different paradigms, the first and second person personal pronouns and the third person personal pronouns. And so here they are. We have ego, mu, autois, and autus being our four different personal pronouns. And now I want to uh, do something, do this a little bit differently, uh, engage the question of use a little bit differently. So uh, I'm going to let you know that one of these pronouns is adjectival. Can you tell me which pronoun here is adjectival? So in this case, our adjectival pronoun is going to be Autus, the same, so adjectival is translated same. Notice here that the definite article uh, occurs uh, before the, um, the uh, third person personal pronoun here. And I actually notice that I have a bit of a Greek typo here, that this 
should be uh, tus, not ton. Uh, so it should match, uh, match these, match logos, the accusative plural, rather than the accusative singular. Um, but because the article comes before autus, we have the uh, adjectival use, which is translated same here. And next, uh, go ahead and pause the lecture, see if you can determine which pronoun is possessive. One of them is possessive in this case. So our possessive pronoun is going to be the mu, my, uh, showing that the sons belong to me. And next, uh, so we've eliminated two of our pronouns so far, mu and autus. Let's see if you can figure out which one is emphatic. This is going to be myself, I myself, ego. So uh, I teach is uh, perfectly acceptable. We don't actually, or do we don't technically need the ego, but it, uh, it gives it a little bit more oomph, a little bit more emphasis. So I myself teach my sons. And then uh, we only have one, uh, one pronoun left here. So the substantive is going to be, of course, our our toys. Our toys is uh, standing for another word in the sentence that came previously, uh, that is its antecedent. Uh, so can you really quickly determine what the antecedent of autois is? The antecedent is going to be tus huius. Autois is going to match in gender and number. This is a uh, masculine plural. And this is masculine plural. In this case, the case is in the dative uh, because I speak to them, whereas over here they are the object of teaching. I teach the, my sons. Um, so rather than uh, being the, whereas they're the object here, they are the indirect object here, which explains why the case is different in the case of the personal pronouns, even though it matches its antecedent as it must in gender and in number. And our last one here, you're doing great. So go ahead and read the sentence aloud to yourself in Greek. Uh, look at my translation here, which I already noticed has a typo. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, in the church, not the church. Um, and see if you can identify the pronouns and their uses here. So we've uh, sort of upped the ante, made it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more going on, asking you to do two different things at the same time. So see if you can identify what the pronouns are and how they're functioning here. All right, I'm gonna give you a little bit more help here. So I have not told you how many pronouns there are. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna give you sort of all the helps at the same time. All of the pronouns and then all of their uses. So see if you can, uh, once again, do this over here. Identify what the pronouns are in the sentence and their uses in Greek. All right, and here are my answers, uh, assuming you can read some of my, uh, my chicken scratch here. So we have autoi being the emphatic use. Uh, we don't necessarily, well, we don't need this, uh, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't match the person here. Genoskamen is first person plural, and this is a third person adjective, um, but one of the special uses of autos is that it can be used as an, uh, an emphasizer. It can be used emphatically. So uh, we ourselves know. So it's giving that uh, gnoskamen more, uh, more, more umph uh, by, being, by using the emphatic autos or autoi in this case. Autes is a substantive. Um, it's referring back to another word in the sentence. In this case, tain hadon, uh, the road. Notice here that we have a, uh, a feminine singular. And over here we have a feminine singular. Hadon uh, is one of those words that's feminine of the second declension. So it kind of looks like a masculine, but it's actually feminine. So it matches in gender and in number, uh, but the cases are different. In this case, uh, it is in the accusative case because the object of the verb gnoska in this case, it is the object of the preposition dia, uh, which has lost its alpha here. Uh, dia takes a, uh, a genitive, and so that's why we have the genitive here. And then our next one, say, is a substantive. Uh, it's being used 
as, uh, as the accusative noun. So we will lead you uh, into the church uh, itself. So the intensive use here. Um, so not the same church, that would be the adjectival or identical use. And if uh, if this were the use that was going on here, we would have autain being right here, uh, that the definite article would directly precede it. Uh, but because it's in predicate position without the direct, uh, without the uh, definite article directly preceding it, it is the intensive use, meaning uh, itself here.